Do what up, man? Money hungry bastards. Alright. Meets one day clay. Mike Nichols. I smoke a lot, I'm in the reefer spot No really, I'm in the reefer spot Want the same respect that a reefer got I reek a pop when I'm in the house, I don't even knock Then punch the clock on the TV show, I don't even watch You see the plot, and when you see me, you see the block This could be a box, the only question to be a knot No Shakespeare, Shaka Zulu, I Shakespeare Y'all shake Shaq and then come to Staten and shake here As far as capping, it ain't here You ain't here, then I'm a chalk it up to some bad credit, we ain't clear My flow sicker than last year I'm past way, I'm sicker than a cervix That need to surface a pap smear Mike Nichols, these children out here got hot nickels They pop pistols, catch licks Not popsicles, you got issues I was talking, you gotta get you Ain't got it with you, your mama gon' need a lot of tissue At first there were two Now there's one Ashes to ashes What's done is done Beat of the drums, raging fire in his eyes. In the end, only one will rise. Common premeditated cold blade to my chest. Never race and stay patient. Learn to sustain all my breast laser beam focus. While some crumble from the stress, perhaps not exactly human, like some have come to suggest. Not boxing, this is chess. I keep 10 steps ahead. Almost respect for my opponents while others just left for dead. Still, they all see red when they find they can't get to me. I make it look effortless. I'm another type of pedigree. I move steadily to the crowd and to dance. Every step is calculated, though it all seems left to chance. Leaving foes in a trance, sort of like new cancer patients. Determination and hope seem to run course adjacent My days spent training in the warm hot sun Only reward, adoration, though I'm scorned by some The day we're all born, we plunge into this world's cold depths A reality relinquished when the steel pierces the chest At first there were two Now there's one Ashes to ashes What's done is done Beat of the drums Raging fire in his eyes in the end, only one will rise. Sometimes I have a feeling of doom. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Universal Dialect Show. Another banger today, show number 41. Um, they just keep coming and coming. I got a great guest on. Uh, he's a representative of the hip-hop culture, specializing in lyricism. He's an author of the book Bars for Days, along with the LP that he dropped a couple of years ago. He's a band leader of an awesome group called Nickel and Dime Ops, which fuses jazz and hip-hop. He's a founding member of the crew MHB, which stands for Money Hungry Bastards. I want to welcome to the show Mike Nichols. What's up, my man? Yeah, sir. What's up, man? Thanks for having me. Appreciate you, G. Yeah, brother. So we were talking before I hit record that, uh, you know, we know a, a common individual named Quest the Unborn Child. He's like That's literally right. like my brother from another mother. That's um, what's up. So let me tell you this really quick story. So like, you know, I don't know if you know, but he moved to North Carolina. Originally, he was living yeah. here in Central Florida. Yeah, um, I saw Yeah. So we... We kind of arranged this get together, his family and my family to, to see each other for the last time before he moved. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so he's like, yo, I got a gift for you. So before he even gave me the gift, I already had you on my radar because of him. He introduced me to your music. So oh. I was thinking of reaching out to you. But uh -huh. because of my nine to five and, and just other interviews and I have another project that I'm working on. And I'm pretty sure, you know, you got like a million things going on, like. It was in the back of my head and I would be like, oh, I got to reach out to Mike Nichols. I got to reach out to Mike Nichols. So what solidified it was he was like, I got a gift for you. And so he he gifted me uh -huh. bars for days. That's what's and up. So as soon as he gifted it, I was like, OK, I'm reaching out to this dude. So 
Nice. You, could thank, you could thank Quest for that. <laughs> What's up, Quest? Yo, much love up, to man. Quest, the onboard child, man. That's that's MHB fan, man. He's he's just like we said before. He's in the thick of everything when it comes to like true hip hop. So yeah, he's just it's just so much respect for that dude. And, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I love it's the dude. Love. Yeah, he he he's that dude that you know what I'm saying. You like is somebody like watching me, and then you look into like the thickets, and somebody's eyes pop up, and it's Quest. You know what I'm saying? Because he's everywhere. You know what I mean? Just yeah. Little, you don't expect him to pop out. He pops out out of nowhere. Yeah, you know, it's funny about me and him is um like first off like we we started like I would say reconnecting because we had met years ago, but we we had to put two and two together. Um, but uh through through the internet, through socials, you know, we all have mutual friends, like you know, and uh, I just it's just like he started posting stuff and I'm liking it. He, I'm posting stuff. He's he's liking. It. I'm like. And I'm like, I start really paying attention. You know, you start, you know, you saw since you have some of the social media, like, kind of like, yo, who? and it's like, damn, man, like, me and him are like from the same cloth. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it just, you just know sometimes, you know, we actually had to have that conversation. Like, yo, you and me are like from the same goddamn planet somewhere, you know, we're like outside of Earth, you know. Um, but then we did some compare some notes and whatnot. And like, I actually lived in Miami. So I was in the scene in Miami for a while too, doing my things. So I went to the U. What up? Big up to you. Word up, and, word up. Uh, and um, so we were out there in the scene together, kind of doing things. And I think the first time we might have ran into each other, or like uh, that we recall, is I was down at the White Room opening for J. Rue, the Damager. And then they had. Um, oh, shit. And then they had a, a like a, a battle cipher afterwards. And he was in it. A bunch of these cats that were all like from the scene at that time were all in it and everything. And I jumped in and everything. It was fun. It was a lot of fun, man. But uh, yeah, it's it's yo. Know, I, I love all the layers of all the different MCs that I've had the chance to meet and work with over the years. You know, it's it's dope to see us all still progressing and doing it. You know, but that's like you say, he's he's one of those dudes. He's in the middle. He's like he's linking people. He, he's officially MHB member now. You know, he worked his way right. into the circle. Like you know, like this is that's just because that's the type of dude he is. You're right. So one love, Questy on one child, man. What up? Love you, Quest. Uh, he's a real dude. Um, let Let's get into because I'm. I, I would imagine there was no such thing as a Mike Nichols. What's the origin story of Mike Nichols? <laughs> where you were born, raised, and and get into like how you got into the hip hop culture. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, I'm originally like I was saying, I'm from uh, Hartford, Connecticut, uh, '80s kid, and a lot of people don't. You know, a lot of people don't know Connecticut kind of gets tucked under when it's being in between New York and Boston and whatever, but. Hartford, Connecticut, I mean, is is a ill little city, you know? You know, and uh, like I say, people go there, they're like, man, motherfuckers got a chip on their shoulder out here. It's like, yeah, it's just something about Hartford, you know? But aside from that, we were probably one of the first communities outside of New York, outside of the Bronx, that we was really embracing hip-hop. And, I mean, this is talking about when I was a little kid, and it was graffiti all over, and cats breaking in the streets, and, you know, everybody had, you know, their – Everybody's big brother had the Fat Boys tapes and, <laughs> and and everything moving on forward. So, like, for me, you know, hip-hop is as long as I can literally remember. Like, as long I have a really, really early childhood memory being in my mother's boyfriend's car, listening to Houdini, the freaks, come out at night. I talk about it in the book and think about, man, who are these freaks? But uh, I love that track, you know? That, that, that track, I could really say, is probably the one that pulled me in. I'm talking, I was, like, very, very little. What What year? Uh, you know what years? I mean, if I had to guess, I mean, I'm 82-ish, 81-ish. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. 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 So you're I way mean, back. Yeah. I mean, I was born in the late 70s, man. You know, so like right like right when hip-hop was coming into fruition, I like to say so was I. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's oh, like I, we kind of follow, follow the same <laughs> parallel. You know, like when I got to high school, teenagers starting to be more aware, that's the golden era of hip-hop. That's, that's Wu-Tang and Nas and everybody coming out and big. Um so yeah, yeah. Um Hartford was ill, man. There was a scene out there. There's a lot of dope MCs. Blackistan, big up, rest in peace, my man Blackistan. Uh, everybody knows him. I had a chance to work with him my man Colombian, who's a great uh beat maker. Uh there's a lot of dope MCs. So from there, I'll say I, I was always a hip hop head. Like I didn't even like I was one of those dudes I wouldn't even listen. If I had a guitar, I wouldn't listen to it. I didn't like rock and roll. There was just hip hop, the public enemy and uh, I mean, you know, Rakim and you know KRS and when BDP first came out, and I mean, we were 
me and my boys, I said, we, you know, you, you know, that generation, we were glued to BET, whatever BET Rap City was putting out. You know, we were observing and deciding that that was the next tape. We were going to go to the record store to buy. Um, and then when I got to college, um, you know, I, I had I played football in high school and that was gone for me, you know. And I didn't really I kind of felt like lost in a way because I was so into like playing football in high school and shit, you know. And uh, my man's he had a four track reporter that he had actually taken from his old high school and <laughs> he had been emceeing for a while. And he was like, yo, man, you ever you ever write rhymes? You know, just trying to find someone to like have fun, spit some bars with. And I had tried a couple of times, but nothing like really serious. And I was like, yeah, man, all right, I'm down. And uh, went over to his crib and then me and him kind of just did this track. I remember he had, we just used to jack um old singles with that had that 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 would have the instrumental on the back. Anything that right. was 99 cent and had an instrumental right. on the back. We would just buy that shit and then, you know, write a rhyme to it basically. And it was the jizz I remember. It was um four chamber or one of these I forgot exactly which one, but um yeah, I spit some shit, you know, and <clears throat> he spit some shit and we were listening to it and it was just like I was amped, man. I was right. amped. I was hooked, you know, because that's the first time I ever like I think my man had just like a fake old like Fisher Price mic before that, you know, the first time I had some equipment and it was, it was fun, man. And and um, me and this cat just started writing and writing and writing and eventually became a group. We actually started calling ourselves the Missing Links before I don't think you remember there was a group called the Missing Links that came yeah. out right before that. We were calling ourselves the Missing Links with an X, you know, right. and uh, yeah, damn, these motherfuckers took our names and shit. And then we just kind of like hyphened it down to the links. And after um, we started in Connecticut. At Eastern Connecticut, but we both transferred to University of Miami together. Um, just because I don't know, he wanted to go, I wanted to get out of Connecticut. I visited, you know, I just wanted to get, I just love Miami, you know, I fell in love with Miami. Right. I'm happy, <clears throat> like, actually, like, so my grandpa, I found out, and I found out was there, and a lot of my family, so like to be immersed in the culture was dope. Um, but yeah, down there was where we started really branching out. That's when we, we, we started performing live. Um, we uh we had some like investors that kind of were like believing us, so they bought us our first NPC. So I learned how to make beats, um, and really started branching out during my days in Miami. That's when we would play um like at Senior Frogs and uh we would play at a uh, spot Billboard Live and Automatic Slims and a lot of places. I remember we opened for Pitt before Pitt was really. Oh, anybody. for real? Yeah, before Pitt had really even blown up, but he had just had Welcome to Miami. You know, like we had a right. chance to. To open for him back That's when he cool. was actually, in my opinion, like actually trying to spit bars before he became Mister Tuxedo and dance right, track, right. you know what I mean? But uh, it's kind of gl blurry and anyway. Yeah, there's a there's a little glimmer, but it. it... Yeah, there we go. There we that, go. That it? Oh, <laughs> it's all right, brother. I don't know what the hell. Anyway, I don't know. All right, it makes, makes me more mysterious, right? Yeah, yeah. There we go. Is it the flavor? <laughs> I think it's this. So yeah, that's that was like part one. That was like part one of my story, you know. And um, me and my man's were doing our thing. We actually had a. Uh, I think I think it's maybe the Venetian blinds behind you. Maybe that's what it is. That's kind of. There we go. Huh? All right, yeah, uh -huh. see my pretty face. All right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there we go. There we go. Come on, man. <laughs> Please, bro. On, <laughs> technology, baby. Technology. technology. <laughs> go ahead, uh, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, me and my man, we had done our thing. We had put an album out uh, together, and um, it was like, end up being, we ended up bringing a girl who was still one of my best friends to this day, and she was singing, and we were rapping, and we became like, very musical. My man was like playing guitar, and I was like running around spitting, and it was, it was fun. And um, it just came to a head, man. You know, like creatively, sometimes you just, you just know. So we just kind of decided to move on. And at that time, I had been dating a girl that I went to college with who had already moved back to Brooklyn. And she was like, yo, just why don't you come live up here and move to Fort Greene with me, right? Like, you know, and I was like, yeah. I was like, you know what? Bet. And I moved up there and I just kind of reinvented myself. I had always been Nickel 5, you know, since I started pretty much uh, Nickel, Nickel 5. And when I came up, I was going solo. I was just kind of going by Nickel for a while. So I put out like a couple mixtapes out the gate, right? When I was just super hungry, because I, I felt like as an MC in that in that band group I was in, I'll call it, 
I was kind of suppressed, you know, like I was so hungry to just spit, 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 spit. I, you know, I just always felt like I could be prolific. And my boy would be like, yo, man, just drop an eight right here. And I'd be like, eight, right. you know, <laughs> know what you're you saying? Know, so, yeah. so I moved up there and I was just like, blah, 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 and I had my studio and I was in, the, in my basement in Brooklyn and Fort Green. And like I said, put out a couple mixtapes, put out my first album, um, played with the orphan, which I'm still proud of. And, uh, and, uh, that's when things started to change for a little bit after that play to the orphan. Cause, um, I had been working at a jazz club kind of just to get by, you know, cause I used to bartend while I was at in college and I picked up this, this job, you know, and, um, these jazz musicians started to get to know me and like, damn, Mike, you, you, your shit is dope. You know, they bring me up for the jam session, whatever, sometimes. And they're like, yo, we should, people, we should make an album. We should make an album. So I decided to take them up on that offer. And we just got, I had all these ideas for beats and I got in the studio with them and basically just jammed out all these ideas I had and turned that into an album. I went home, I cut up all those ideas, turned it into a whole slew of beats. And then I just wrote to that. And that was the foundation of what ended up becoming Nickel and Dime Ops, which you mentioned earlier, my band project. And um, that band project propelled me in a lot of ways because one, when you're working with really, really, really talented musicians, they're going to up elevate your game. They're going to teach you about things that you didn't know about even as an MC. You know, like I have flow and I, I was confident in my lyricism, but like they taught you about tone. They taught you about timing. They taught the technical things that you wouldn't even really think about until you start around being around individuals like that. And also being on stage with them two, three times, maybe four times a week sometimes. That's another thing, you know, and it would just be me. I had no hype, man. So I'd be up there for 60, 70, 80 minutes at a time every night. And that just elevates your right. your skills, your skillmanship. It just there's just no way around it when you're performing like that. It's like so training. That was that yeah. And you know, it was big. And because it was like that crossover with the jazz, it's, it was hip hop. Don't get me wrong, it was very like roots, but it had like I would let my guys like play a lot of their instruments, but it had it was hip hop, you know, but like um because it had that jazz element that crossover opened up a lot of doors for me. You know, I got to play at places like the Blue Note. I would have never been able to. I got to play at, uh, I got flown to Athens, Greece to do this major festival and they paid us really well to do my thing and spit in front of a bunch of people in Europe. You know what I mean? I mean, Uh all that came from the band. But then at the same time, I was still on another linear plane working and growing with MHB, Money Hungry Bastards, you know? Uh And um, I don't know, how much you've delved into the group, but I, I, I'm very proud of MHB. I really, I wholeheartedly believe that we might be one of the most underrated hip hop crews in the scene, possibly in history. I mean, I might be going out on a limb because I'm biased, but <laughs> I'm just saying, like, you got Masai Bay, you got Lifelong, you got Mr. Cord, Witchcraft, myself, Citizen Kane, Dick Dashley, who is actually kind of a really unknown just be- on his own. I would say on his own terms because he doesn't really push himself like that, but he's one of the dopest rappers I've ever heard, period. And I've right. worked with some of the best. <clears throat> um, so that also for me was special and like helped me really, I think, elevate my game as well. So I had like both of these things happening at once, you know, musically and then working with just some of the best lyricists in the world, like, you know, steel sharp and steel type shit. Oh, yeah, know? dude, without a doubt. Like, I yeah. like. Masai Bay, I know from the Panacea Goldmine. I reviewed that in Insomniac mm-hmm. back in the days. And then Lifelong used to be in a group called Writers Guild with Lower Velocity. And that's one oh, of my yeah. one of my yeah. favorite rap groups. Uh-huh. I remember building with Lifelong to try to get him to send me like that EP that they uh-huh. dropped. But he didn't even have copies of it. But like <laughs> the crew that you have is like literally they're just assassins, bro. Yeah. So let's I go. Mean- since you talked about Dime Ops, we'll talk Dime Ops and then we'll get into MHB. What have you released with Dime Ops so far? Um, like I said, the first one was experimental. So at that time, I have still I was going to I, I had kind of switched my name. I have multiple names as you go through right. my catalog, but at that time I was going as Nickel Kills Mike's. Right. I just kind of evolved into that. And why? Um, what what's with, what's with Mike Nichols? Yeah, and Nickel Kills, Kills Mike. Kills Mike's. You know what's so funny? Cause that actually kind of like parallels with what was happening in social media at the time, because a lot of my fans and even people that I work with to this day come from when I was with MySpace, right? And that when I was on MySpace, I was able to call myself Nickel and I just left it like that. 
and like literally to this day, I have fans that still follow me hardcore. I wish MySpace never fucking vanished. I'm gonna be honest, dude. They they it because of Facebook. Fake, yeah. Facebook destroyed MySpace on purpose because they were hundred percent, hundred percent. So when I transferred over to Facebook, they said, "Well, you can't just be nickel. You got to be nickel something." <sighs> and I'm not putting. I'm not putting my government name, so I'm like, right. what the fuck? What do I? What does Nickel do? And I was like, well, Nickel kills mics. I put it <laughs> as like almost like a joke, and um, it caught on. All of a sudden, you start googling Nickel kills mics, and there was like all these hits, and I'm like, all right, well, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna run with that, you know. So when I made that first experimental album with that band, which eventually became Nickel and Dime Ops, I just came out as Nickel kills mics and it was called tragedy and comedy and then we made two other albums where we actually went in the studio and we had stuff written prior to you know getting to that studio one of them was called the soul ligamist which i actually co-produced with ian hendrickson smith who was the sax player from the roots now he wasn't at the time he was working with quest but now he's like he's been the official roots saxophone player for over a decade now he's on Fallon every night and everything Oh, that's dope. That, and that's my man's, and he's got <clears throat> Grammys. I mean, not trying to like name uh, drop and all that thing, but he's got Grammys galore, and he's just right. a super talented uh, individual. So that was a dope experience for me working with him. Yeah, Mike, and, you can name drop, okay? <laughs> you're, you're yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just don't like being that dude. I'm not a dick rider, man. You know what I'm saying? Like not dick riding, bro. It's the truth. You know? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, he's he's a. Uh, it was cool because I actually saw him when they did that tour. Uh. I saw him with LL Cool J. I got to go backstage. I was chilling with him and Black Thought and everybody, right. like mm-hmm. drinking tequila and smoking blunts with Black Thought. You know what I'm saying? It was, that was that was like, damn, bro. Like I said, but I ain't a dick rider, though, so I didn't take no photos. <laughs> I'm like, yo, my man's like, why you get no pictures? I'm like, yo, I ain't going to be like, yo, 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 Thought, let me, uh, it's just, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, just not it. me, B. Like, I don't know. I just, you know, it ain't me, man. <laughs> but um, so then, then we put out another album, um, 2018. And that's the most recent Dime Ops one. That's called um, Resuscitation Music. And that one was different because we had switched around a lot of members of the band in between. And it became a lot more, I would say, like soulful vibe on that, that a little funkier, a little more soulful. Um, and that was really special to me because I, I had raised money to make that happen. And we we did. We raised a really strong amount of money to get to the studio to to put that back out and everything like that so um yeah those are the two that one actually we got gene baylor on there who is who uh is one of the members of jane you know yeah and remember jane yeah yeah and she's uh i mean she had become a good friend of mine through working through the jazz scene because she has what that's where she had transferred over to and man that was a special moment man she came in we had written this track my boy kept saying man mike i want to write like a a hip hop ballad, a hip hop ballad, right? So thinking about it, and I just came up with this idea to have like a really kind of like slow beat that would and that would double time, keep double time and then like slowing up, you know? And I wrote this part for her. And I remember we were in the studio and she came in and she's nervous. This is this is Jean Baylor from Johnny. She's nervous. She's got platinum hits, right? And she goes, Mike, I can't believe you wrote these lyrics. This shit is so good. I remember that. I'll never forget that. And uh when we when we recorded, it was like you could hear a pin drop. Like it just like everybody just like, cause she's just so gifted. She's definitely like, undoubtedly one of the most gifted people I ever had a chance to work with. Very proud of that. She just she keeps getting her band. It's called um the Baylor Project. Shout out to her and her husband Marcus Baylor. They keep getting nominated for Grammys like almost every year now. And for whatever reason, the Academy ain't given to them. So this year, if anybody's listening, man. You got to give it to her. She's one of the most talented human beings on earth. She deserves it. So, shout out to the Baylor Project. But yeah, that's Dom Ops in a nutshell, man. We we were at Smoke Jazz Club for uh, eight and a half years. Every Thursday night, it was the midnight set. But we became like a kind of local legend in the Upper West Side. And uh, to do a residency like that every week, rain, shine. I'm talking sick. People in my family passed away. I'd be whatever it was. I was there, man. Like right. and uh. That 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 was a true testament to to just the love of the art because they weren't, you know, not to not to slight them, but it's not like they were paying us well. It was a late night set at a jazz club who are notoriously not known for paying artists very well in general, right? So, but they you know they let us drink our face off and they'd feed us and they put a little money in our pocket, you know what I mean? So, and we just had a blast, and that's 
that the but I you know I'll say this that's when people were still buying CDs I feel like they really kind of dried up over the last couple of years but people still have been buying CDs right. up to even like three four five years ago for pretty heavily so I would be in the I'd make a little chance you know little cheese like gotcha that, you know? but uh, so so I want to ask you a question because uh, is there like a significance with nickels or the number five the reason why you use nickel uh, I like to say. Uh, it's a pun, like you know, my my lyrics stimulate the five senses. You know, I really like to, I like to highlight. I like, I like to make you feel like you're immersed in the world when you when you listen to my lyrics. Right. So that the pun comes from that nickels. You know, originally it was nickel, and then like I said, it's funny because the hood started calling me nickels. Yo, what up, nickels? You know, like the hood loves to add s's to shit. You know what I'm saying? So that's just they just call me nickels. You know what I mean? So then when I decided it was time to evolve again, my real name is Mike. And you know, I feel like you get a little older, you get a little weird. Like sometimes you just want to introduce yourself, like yo, I'm Mike, right? You, you know, yo, I'm Nickel. Da, da. People, you know, sometimes you know. So, uh, <laughs> so I just kind of just like make this new fusion. I wanted to just kind of rebrand myself. So Mike Mike Nichols has been the new uh, incarnation. And the only thing I've released is is bars for days so far. But I say so far because I'm getting ready to release a new tr- uh, eight track EP. Which I'll talk about. Which Word. All right. All right. All right. All right. Cool. 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 All right. So let's get into like your discography because that's the thing. Like when I try to look you up, mm-hmm. you have stuff scattered in different places. So right. you release. You say you release something with missing links. You know. So so we were called the missing links, but we eventually right. became just the links. So okay. We, and we released one album. It's called Loose Change. It's a fun. It's a fun. It's a fun album. Um, very what musical. Year? Oh five. Oh five. Is it out? Is it like? Is it yeah, something it, it, really it's, big? It's it's. I'll say this. It's it's eclectic. It's 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 got more like a De La tribe kind of vibe. If you know Fuji's kind of vibe, it was like almost like it could have fit into Native Tongues or something. You know right. what I mean? It, it, I got you. That because that's what my collective with my man's and like I said, we had the singer, and it just it was a little more eclectic. You know, for me, I just wanted to give me the mic, give me the mic. So you, then you'll see me just drop in and like drop a sixteen or something. But uh, <laughs> it's dope. It's it's a it's a fun ride. It's a fun listen to for I think for a true hip hop head. And if you did like tribe and things like that, right? Yeah, it's it's in that vein. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look um, for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's definitely on Apple Music. I think it's on Spotify too. But it's definitely on Apple Music. Uh, Loose Change is called. And is it then, digital, um, the digital only, or did you release physical material? We, we, we have CDs, um, and I still have some in a box. So if anybody wants one, let dude, me know. I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah. Tell me how yeah. much I'll cop, dude. <laughs> <laughs> All right, word. I got a whole, I got a whole plethora yeah. of of these. You know what I mean? Because yeah, you know the game. Like to get CDs, I don't know the the, the people out there know, but to to get CDs pressed, they kind of got you by the nuts, right? Because to get a thousand, they'll charge you a dollar each, packaged. Everything looks pretty, just like you get it. If you get less than a thousand, they want to charge you four or five dollars a piece. Oh yeah. So you can get two hundred for a thousand, or you can get a thousand for a thousand, right? Right. And then usually what happens is most, you know, that last batch you get, you know, it starts to dry out, right? And then you got like a hundred left, two hundred left, right? <laughs> you know, so I got you, yeah. Throughout yeah. time, I got boxes, you know. Of different of the, all, all these projects, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, my friend, yeah. He, he had a, a a business, and he told me like, if you're gonna start a business, don't do business where like you have inventory, because you it, you you'll wind up stacking up and you'll have shit, and then you'll sell it for ten times less than what you bought it for, and it's not worth it. So, and I know plenty of artists that have boxes, like even like Quest himself, like he's got boxes of yeah. of like his material that after, after a while dries out. Yeah, what do you what? do with it? You ain't gonna get rid of it. It's your, yeah. it's your art. You, so yeah, you just, exactly. Just, just sit. Well, like, that, I mean, that's why I came up with the idea for bars for days because I really realized people weren't um, buying CDs no more. Right. And I was like, well, what else can I put out? You know, that people could physically take with them. You know what I mean? So boom. You know what I'm saying? Came up with the book. Word up. Uh, and uh, yeah, that was cool because then you go into the book and then like you, you saw, I'm sure like a couple pages in, there's a QR code, and then you can. You can go right and stream that stream the album, you know, and the album has parallels throughout the book, you know. So, so after um, links, what did what did you drop after links? Like so physical, oh, whatever. Yes. So, like I said, that's when I moved to Brooklyn. Physically, my first, my next one was oh eight, 
I believe, and that was the journey of Plato the Orphan, just under the name Nickel. That as well is on Apple Music, but I just realized it's not on Spotify, so I gotta I gotta try and see what's up with that. Um, but that was um my first solo joint, you know, so I put a lot of love. I took a lot of time. Um, I made a lot of those beats. I outsourced some beats. Uh my man uh Gianni Cash from from uh from Miami, he played with Mayday and Aboriginal. Uh he made a good handful of those beats. Uh and it's dope. It's dope, man. It's definitely me progressing and learning how to become like a dude who drops a twelve or a sixteen or eight here to holding down an entire song. You know, I really for me, I really wanted to establish myself as a songwriter. It's not just like, yo, I'm not one of these MCs where I'm just gonna come out and spit like fifty eight bars and that's the end of the song. Like you're gonna get two, three, sometimes four verses. You're gonna get hooks. You're gonna get little bridge parts. You're gonna, you know, that's part of my musicality, you know. But so that's there's a lot of exploration, but it's dope lyrically. It's a dope album. And then from there, I put out that first band album. I think that was 2010, which was Tragedy and Comedy under Nickel Kills Mics. We spoke about that a little bit. And then my next solo follow up, which is to me, honestly, I was listening to it the other day. I, I really feel like it's still my, I don't want to say it's my absolute best work, but it's it's my personal favorite, probably. I'll say that. Um, and that's the disease, the cure, and the promise, which is that's when I first had linked up with Lifelong. And there's a lot of Money Hungry Bastard influence, and Masai Bay is on that album. And I don't know if you had a chance to listen to that, but to me, that's a, that's a classic. I'm still making a lot of my beats at that time. And um, like I said, outsourcing and stuff. Because I, you know, we got to a point, there's a lot of beat makers in MHB, and there's just as your notoriety progresses as an MC, you got people in your inbox all the time. Like, yo, man, yo, man, you want these beats? You want these beats? You don't got to pay for them, man. You just want, I just want you to spit to them. So I'm like, yeah, all right, I'll take this one. I'll take it. And uh, so then from there, you got the two Dime Ops albums, Bong Bong, and then Bars for Days is my most recent release. But I didn't do any physical other than the book on that shit. Right. So but <clears throat> that one is the first one where I didn't make any of the beats myself. I just decided I wanted to focus on the lyrics and um, I reached out to a lot of people and uh, they all came through with, with fire. <laughs> right. So what, what would you say, Mike, is the the pros and cons of being, let's say, solo versus a group? Because you said, like, you wanted to spit so bad so much when you were with the Lynx, mm -hmm. you know, and the thing is you have to share that with somebody else and then you're kind of like, you kind of held down a little bit. You can't just kind of just, you know, explode like how you probably want to. What are the pros and cons of being in a group and let's say like being solo? Yeah, I mean, the, obviously the pros of being in a group are that you, you, you can share ideas. I mean, there's definitely, you're going to get much more probably unless you're just like some like absolute crazy savant. More, more minds are better than one. You know what I'm saying? Like right. it just, it's just naturally how it is. And sometimes those Ideas might conflict and contrast, but a lot of times you're gonna also gonna find moments where it's just like this beautiful harmony. Like, oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, you didn't even think about that. Yeah, let's put that there. Bum bum bum. And now you have this whole just just expanded idea off that original version. You know, there's a lot of joints on that album I could point to where it started with one idea and one beat, and by the time that song had flipped a few times, it was a completely different uh, version of that. So that's. I think that's it, like pushing each other, especially when you're really in sync with each other. That's the thing, man. It's hard if you don't get along with that person. Like I said, uh, the main MC, uh, we call we ended up calling Diddy Dunn because he was actually the first Diddy before Puffy was calling himself Diddy. That's another <laughs> story. Uh, he uh, is still one of my best friends this day, one of my brothers. But I think he'll he'll agree too. Like if we got back in the lab, we probably kill each other because. <laughs> it just got to that point after time. Like at first, it was like yeah, 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 and then it was like our ideas started conflicting. conflicting. Right. And by the end, it was just like I felt like everything I said, he'd be like, eh, "Yeah, let's try this," and vice versa. Like I said, you right. know, like you grow apart. So when you're solo, yeah, I mean it's amazing. You can do whatever the hell you want. Dude, right. I can, I can go on the mic, and take a shit, and record it. Put it on. I mean, you can you can tell me nothing, right? Like, uh, and but more importantly, like as your your personal artistry has no bounds though you could 
Like, you know, whatever you want to talk about, whatever you want to say, however you want to put it. And at first, I think that's kind of difficult if you hadn't done it. You know, like at first it was like, like I said, it took me a while to really learn how to like what I felt I needed to do to keep the song exciting from front to back. You know, you don't want to like, you can't like start waning and like, you know, if it don't make sense no more, the song will lose its interest. People are going to, this is the skip generation, baby. Bonk. <laughs> next, next, bonk. Huh. Right. You want people to get front to back, you know? So in the beginning, I think that's, that's difficult, but I think in the end it was, uh, it was it was well worth it for me because I became I learned how to become that. Now, when I write songs, it's a it's a song. B. I think that's a that's a big thing that really differentiates me from a lot of MCs. Even a lot of the, the more legendary ones that have bigger names than I am. They really they're just they're just oxes. You put them in the ring, they're gonna oh, they're gonna put out you know sixty four verses. It's gonna be amazing. But how many how many dope MCs you ever see try to put out an album if you can't even listen to it because they don't have the ability to like construct something that that makes you want to listen to it the entire way through. Right. You know what right. I'm saying? Because we can think of countless. I mean, the the biggest one I was thinking about was cannabis. Cannabis was one of the dopest one on one rappers you might have ever seen. He tried to come out with an album and get weird, and you maybe you could kind of blame it on Wyclef, whatever. But at the end of the day, you you got to put that on him. He came out. He's the, he's the writer of the lyrics, and he was not able to put together an album and hardly I would say even any songs on that album where you would just listen to it and be like, Oh yeah. All right. I'm going to listen to this whole thing. Right. He didn't have that ability. And there's yeah. other MCs that that's just like the first one pops in my head. Right. I, I got a lot of dope MCs that I fuck with. That I love, but really that's their strong suit. Like put them on a cameo. They might be the dopest rapper you ever heard. Get them to try to write an album. It's, it's kind of hard for them, right? Right. It's a different, <laughs> different sort of game or a different animal. Like, like mm -hmm. you said, cannabis, you know, battling, he's probably one of the greatest MCs ever. Uh, you throw him on a cameo, one of the greatest ever. But when he when it comes to like song structure, because I know what you're saying. What you're saying is you you got to create material that keeps the person there and not something that's all over the place where like there's spots where you're like, oh, I'm going to skip this part where he rhymes. But this last part I'll, I'll listen to because it seems like, you know, he had his shit together on that part. You know what I mean? Right. If you even like, get what, to that last part. Right. Well, if you, yeah. Listen. Right. If you Once even you get skip, there. You right. skip, right? Right. <laughs> I feel you. That's, I understand that, bro. So this next question for you, bro, mm -hmm. because you said something that's very similar to, I talked to a, an artist named Q Nikon out of the West Coast, and you said something similar to him, like how when you started solo, you were handling a lot of your own production. Mm -hmm. So was that more pressure on you? Did that kind of take away from your rhymes? Whereas now bars for days, you have that freedom now where you give somebody else the realm of the production. You pick and choose what you like and matches with your music. And now you're in sync with it. And now you're able to just take off. Absolutely. I mean, like I said, I, I like to make beats. I enjoy it. I haven't done much lately, but I want to, I've been meaning to get more back into that. So I liked it. And I wasn't thinking about it while I was making those earlier albums, but it was taken up. It, it, it caused me to, to take, I would say it's, it, it slows down the production, man, where you can get, if I just have all these beats and rhymes, like I, beats and just write rhymes, I could knock out 15 songs in months, you know, go record it. Boom. Hand it to somebody to mix. Boom. Like I did my part. And in that regard, my absolute focus is just, on the lyricism itself and those beats and that's 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 really what i'm investing my energy into so i'm gonna give you more i feel like not to say that i wasn't giving it as much it's just it's just when your energy gets split up like we creatively you're not giving you it's, it's just impossible i feel like to give it that 120 percent in one direction right but um making those beats it, it's, it's a lot of fun like i said but when I when I went to bars, I just knew. I after I had been working with the band and the band, like I was I was driving the ideas for the music, but I wasn't coming up with the music. You know what I'm saying? Like eventually, it was like this is y'all part. I'm gonna write my part. We're gonna meet in the studio. We're gonna meet on stage, and we're gonna. And I found like a beauty in that. I felt like I could really enjoy just being a, an MC. So when I wanted to come back on some beats and rhyme shit after I hadn't been for a while. I really just wanted to focus on the craft. You know what I mean? 
But now I've been kind of itchy. I might, I'm gonna start. I, I'm really thinking I'm gonna start making some beats and things like that again. I'm gonna, I want to get the NPC one. That's my goal because I had the four thousand, but I actually got rid of it because I didn't like the software inside of it. It was a dope machine, but the software was jacked. And because I don't know if y'all know the story, but like Akaya had shut down right after they made the NPC four thousand, and the software was never properly updated. So there were a lot of glitches in it. You know, like you'd yeah. be trying to like trim a sample. And it would freeze and you had to know oh i have to hit this button twice and this and this and then go back and then i could right go back and trim the sample shit like that it's like you don't want to be thinking about that when you when you're just trying to be in right. the moment you know so, it, was, it was making you do more than you wanted to yeah it slows you down you know what i'm saying like divert your attention you know what i mean i don't know well yeah I got so you, yeah I, oh. I, I mean i love it all man to me hip-hop you know the beat side of it the the lyrical side of it um they're both equally important. I mean, a lot of people, they don't even listen to lyrics. I talk to a lot of people that are like, they love hip hop, but they're not like heads. You know what I'm saying? Like to get into, oh, I want to hear what what uh, Doom says right here. You know what I mean? There's people that really care about the lyrics. And they don't care. So, they, they usually generally still care about the beats, but it's not like their main concern. Like, I want to hear the MC destroy it, right? But then there's people... A lot of people that listen to this, especially they, listen, they like rap, I'll say. They like they like the culture. They could care less about what the dude is saying. I've had people tell me that straight up, like, yeah, I've listened to you, you're dope, but I, I just not my I don't I don't listen to lyrics like that. That's why they, they'll sit there and I got you know, they're listening to those like catchy, poppy records, cause they just like the beat. I know right. you're rolling your eyes, but Yeah, man. <laughs> it, 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 we got to be real, you know. There's there's two sides of that, right? right? Like it's just like we can't expect every listener to listen like someone like you and I would listen. Because I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna dissect the wordplay. I'm gonna yeah, dissect me the flow. That's what I'm gonna, too, man. Yeah, that's I want to. <laughs> I want to. If it's really good, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it back, listening to it again. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, that's that's a special uh craft, a special type of human being. I think. <laughs> you I know? know. I understand, yeah, man. It, yeah. There's a few of us out there. There's not a lot of us. Out there. there used to be a ton of us at one point, but I feel like we're dying out little by little. There's not many of us out there. You, you know? know, I say that, but then I, sometimes I'll come across some some youth that's that's into it. You know, and it's that's that's dope to see. There's like there's a whole like subsect of the youth that's not listening to the to the mumble rap and all that shit. They are really they're like, oh yeah, you know what I just got into for the first time. I'm like, what's that? They're like, oh, I was just listening to a what was it? I met this kid the other day. He was. I was just dissecting, uh, you know, all the Sean Price stuff. I had never heard it before. Oh, For me, I, I've that. known. I had known everything, obviously, from Sean Price. But it's cool right. to see this kid who's like nineteen, and his right. eyes are big, and he's like, "This guy, this is flow, right?" It's, it's, it's there. You know, this, the, it's just, you know, we're in a time where people, people want the easy route, man. People, people just, they don't listen to albums straight up. You know, that's a commitment. They just want to put their shuffle play on. They want to skip through it, you know. What I mean, it's just the culture has changed. the 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 way that uh, a lot of kids, I say kids, but like people, like millennials and younger, they listen to you know stuff the way that they look at their social media, like Snapchat. Boom, 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 boom. I'm swiping. I'm swiping. You know, what I mean, like ten, you know, they're, they're, they're swiping, swiping. They 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 don't have the I won't say it's the mental fortitude. They just don't have the desire to have that fortitude. You know, it took a commitment. I felt like we would listen to that. I would go out and get 1995 or whatever, go get the Smith and Wesson album. I couldn't wait to hear it. And I would just play it over and over and over and over. Front Wear that back. shit out. Yeah. Until I knew, till I knew every, I could just, I could turn it off and spit all the lyrics. Right. You know? That was a thing, like, in the 90s, even the early 2000s. People would just walk around spitting someone's lyrics, like, from front to back. Like, you know, I mean, not even with no headphones on. You just knew, I knew, I knew puns verse. You know, what I mean, I would just spit that shit because I could. You know, that's not like, that's just not what people are looking for. So, we got to keep doing what we do because that's what we do because we love right. it. I'm an MC. I'm gonna keep pushing my creative boundaries, my lyrical boundaries. You know, but that's just because that's what I am. And if people gravitate to it. That's amazing. That's a plus, right? So, that's right. just a, that, that's so where that, I'm at that, with it. Let's dissect this, okay? I wanted to talk to you about it later, but let's bring it up now since we're talking about it now, right? So you you born late 70s. I was born like mid-70s. And we were there when the hip-hop 
culture was nothing and then it started to kind of blow up i want to say like from the mid 90s till about like the early 2000s the mm -hmm. underground was like on fire you had all these like independent labels you know dev jokes was coming out you had fondling records you had like stone's throw you had all uh, raucous you had all these groups coming out mm -hmm. most dev talib quality all these they were start they, they were just about to break through the boundaries this is when bet rap city and yom tv raps and the box you know ralph mcdaniel's thing mm -hmm. were showing like all videos so you can watch like a biggie video watch a hieroglyphics video like you know souls of mischief you know i'm wearing souls of mischief you could watch a Saphir video. You could watch like a fucking boot camp click video. And it was all meshed together. You know, a uh, fucking um, DJ quick video. You know what I'm saying? And you could pick You could pick and choose what you like. And even sometimes you found yourself, tell me if I'm wrong, liking some of the gangster rap stuff. Like, you know, yeah, I mean, some of them I'm, would look. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, yeah. I mean, like the West Coast gangster shit. Like, I mean, Snoop. I mean, Snoop was yeah. dope. I, I get a front when that doggy style shit came out. I, I bumped that shit, man. Uh, Dre. Um, I mean, the gangster shit. A lot of the West Coast shit, though, too. Like, I like, like you mentioned, Souls, Far Side. They, they didn't get the love. I mean, there's a lot of people that still dig them, but I don't, I feel like they got like overshadowed, you know, at that right. time. You know, yeah. Dell, Dell and all these people. Um, but yeah, the underground movement at that time was, I mean, it's the golden era. I mean, right. you talked about the Rockets and, company flow and i mean come on man like it's the golden era in my opinion of i'll say this hip-hop with extreme amounts of substance and depth like you listen to an album talk about people that are a generation that doesn't want to put in the work they're not going to sit there and bust out right like a cannibal ox album and dissect it they're going right. to be like oh this is too, too much. much yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm someone is, like you know what I mean. I'm hungry for that. I'm like, give it to me, give it to me, give it to right. me. Like you know, what I'm saying like Galactic. But what happened? What happened, Mike? Because like I said, it like 2000. I felt like then Rockets goes under. Stone's Throw is not making as men, as much music, and I felt like as we were about to break through and at least just stake our claim, put our stamp on shit, mm -hmm. our dicks got slapped in the dirt, and then. <laughs> The generation didn't pass down that knowledge to the generations that's coming up. And that's why you have these kids that just want to do what I feel cookie cutter rap with just catchy beats. Something happened. Was it I, constructed I, that way? Was it on purpose? Do you feel? Yeah. I think part of I think it was partially constructed. I think it's, there's a few things that happened. I think one thing that really kind of shifted the game and that happened, it happened a little earlier than just 2000, but it, it, it made that mark was when... Biggie and Pac were at their height. West Coast, East Coast, the amount of influence they had was so powerful that when they both got murked out, the dopest MCs were like, oh, shit, I don't want that to happen to me. And what happened? You saw Nas. That's when, that's when Nas went through his Uchi Wally phase. And right. Bob Deep started coming out with tracks that were – Jig, like with the lack of a better term, jiggy. You know what I'm saying? Like mob yeah. fucking mob deep. <laughs> you know, just look at their name and then look at the music that, that that came out. It like especially for New York hip hop. I think in the West Coast too, it softened the vibe. It made it more uh I wanna say like radio friendly. They became more focused on being radio friendly than being substance heavy at that time. And I think that was part of it. I think that set it off on a path because I think I do spend a lot of time thinking about this. I think there is a lot of legitimacy to um, some of the things like I think it was Reverend Run and some people, Chuck D and these guys have come out talking about how the the music industry was kind of in cahoots. I'll say with the government trying to crush the urban movement, the black movement, the Latino movement, the fact that we were getting hip hop was making us smarter stronger right. more powerful you know the, the, and that's not what they wanted <laughs> they want we're supposed to be the, the sheep that you keep suppressed you know what i'm saying so i think that was part of it i think they started getting the ears of these major labels um the ruckuses and stuff it could be that they were suppressed it could also be that they weren't making that much money as dope as they were like things let's talk about it on a financial level like these smaller underground labels are usually doomed no matter what kind of music they're putting out because underground 
at the end of the day, it's hard to run that label, and it's very hard to make money off of it. At the end of the day, it could be any type of music, you know, when it's underground. Then there's there's another variable, and I think this is this is it as well, is the MP3 age, the the streaming age, just destroyed the music business in general, and that just times out with everything else. I mean, right after hip hop started to make that turn, being a little softer, I'd say a little more club friendly instead right. of you know like dry, riding out drinking a forty with your homie friendly. Um, just the industry in general just changed, and they. It's, it's never been the same. It's never going to be the same. You know, they don't sell CDs no more because of that. Eventually, it all changed. So I think it's I think it's just a combination of all that stuff that brought us to where we are. The other side of that, too, though, is the artists like me, you know, a lot of the MCs, I'm sure that you interviewed, we might not even have had a chance, you know, to, to, to have any type of audience. So, yeah, maybe I have, like, my daughter thinks it's amazing. I have 10,000 fans that follow me on Instagram. She thinks that's my nice. six. She thinks that's incredible, right? It is I might, not, I, I might not ever even have that. Right. You know what I'm saying? Be, without the, the fact that social media gave me a platform, the fact that I can put out my music on through CD Baby and get it on every Spotify, Apple, Tidal, Amazon, people can listen to it. It leveled the playing field, right? So that's good. That's a beautiful thing. So there, there's tons of underground artists, and you know that. Yes. A lot of people don't really, oh, hip hop is dead. Hip hop is dead on the radio, and it's dead on the radio for a reason. If you want hip hop that was like something you heard in 1996, 97, you could find it. There's plenty of dope artists that are doing it. It's out there. You got to put in that work. You got to go look right. for it, right? Or someone's well, got to put you on to it. You had to do it back in the days anyway, right? Because you had to go to record stores. Well, and, yeah. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, but at the same time, wasn't like BT. In places like that, push at least putting out like you would at least get glimpses of it. Like right, you might get one video from somebody. You're like, yo, who the fuck? Yeah, Cellar Dwellers. Like, yeah, Cellar Dwellers yeah. was pretty pretty much underground. Shout out right. to all these cats, right? But they were pretty much underground. But I first heard them because they had a video on BT, and then I went and started like you said, go record store, digging through the crates, figuring out what they had. You know what I'm saying? Getting their albums. But yeah, I, it, it's it's a double edged sword, man. Gotcha. It really is, bro. It really is. I, I mean, I feel grateful, but I think it also has given people the opportunity that aren't strong MCs uh, to get a platform. Right? There's so many artists out there that let's be honest, man, they suck. They don't. They don't deserve. I'm not. I'm, I'm not trying to be a dick, but like, no, they it's, don't, the, it's the fucking truth. There used to be a time. We're from the same time. If you don't spit, unless you got bars, you don't get on the mic. And very well, damn well, don't record and put out music if you don't haven't earned the right to be there. Now, there's hundreds of artists coming out every year, and they think their shit is amazing. You know, I get it. I was there. Like, you know, I'm not saying I was the dopest MC when I started, but it took time to get to where I was. There's so many artists out there that are just they're just trash, man. And it's, it, it oversaturates the market. And I think that's one of the biggest detriments to hip hop today, if I'm being real. I think you meet a lot of people, right? You talk about rap, or if you say, hey, I'm I'm an MC, or I'm a, even if you're like a producer, DJ, I make hip hop. People go, oh. <laughs> like people that aren't really hip hop fans, they go, oh, yeah. Oh, cool, man. Yeah. Because they got fucking 45 other friends that say they're rappers. Right. And maybe three of them are, are decent and the rest of them fucking suck. And I'm not trying to be an asshole. Like I said, like I I, I love that you love hip hop, but I think people got to know their lanes too because that oversaturation, I think, is where we are today. Just It's destroying the potential of hip hop. You can't have like five diamonds in the rough and then fucking 85 other dudes that suck and then we all come out at once and think that the population is going to go, oh, let's see what's happening in hip hop. No, that... Why would I? I'm not going to sift through all that trash just so I can find a couple dope rappers in the, in, the, in, the, in the midst of it all. So it's great that people like me and artists like Lifelong could, like me and Lifelong are, put, are, are working on music right, right now. We're going we're gonna to put it out soon. That's amazing, right? Like we get to yeah. do that even though a label is not going to give us that. We're going to do it ourselves, right? But at the same time, when we put out that music, there's going to be a hundred other MCs that just, I'm not even calling them MCs, rappers that came out that are going to saturate that market and they're not going to be that great. So pros and cons, right? You pros said and pros cons. and cons. That's the pros yeah. and cons of it all, right? So, yeah. The Universal Dialect Show will return. 
But first, a word from our sponsor. In a world where style knows no boundaries, where self-expression reigns supreme, there is Arise Creations. Introducing Arise Creations, the ultimate destination for fashion-forward individuals seeking affordable, unisex apparel that caters to every unique style. Arise Creations brings you an exceptional collection of unisex fashion essentials. From trendy tops that blend style and comfort to versatile bottoms and footwear that add an extra layer of sophistication. We've got you covered from head to toe. Arise Creations is more than just a clothing line. We strive to create an inclusive space where everyone can find fashionable and affordable pieces that reflect their unique personality. With indelible designs, we ensure that anyone can confidently wear our products, breaking down barriers while embracing individuality. But that's not all. Arise Creations is proud to be affiliated with the Universal Dialect Show, a groundbreaking podcast that explores the worlds of music, paranormal, art, fashion, and beyond. Join the conversation on YouTube, BitChute, Spotify, App Podcast, and all of your favorite podcasting platforms. Arise Creations is committed to making fashion accessible to all. We believe that styles should know no bounds and everyone deserves to feel confident and empowered in what they wear. With our affordable prices and diverse product range, we're here to help you unleash your true self. Come and unleash your style and embrace your individuality. Arise Creations, where fashion meets affordability and self-expression. Please visit our website today to explore our collection and be a part of the fashion revolution. Arise Creations and the Universal Dialect Show, empowering you to create your own destiny. Head to www.etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash Arise Creations 73. Again, that's www.etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash Arise Creations. So that's A R I S E. C R E A T I O N S, the number seven and the number three, and bring your look to new heights. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about, bro, uh, to me, you're a unique artist, not only because of lyrically, but the way that you kind of do things. And this goes way back. OK, the reason why I'm saying this is like when people shoot videos, most of their videos are the usual urban landscape, trains, graffiti, all this stuff. But you did something different even 15 years ago when you dropped um, Impossible Feats. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, sir. So yes, sir. Can you talk about that video, where you were at and what gave you the idea to shoot a video like that because I don't think I've seen anybody really do that like yeah. that. So that um as you mentioned, yeah, that that was shot at um um Machu Picchu in Peru, 2008. Me and my homies um just backpacked through Peru, you know, like we just I had traveled a little bit, but that was my first time I think like kind of backpacking and seeing like ruins, I, I'm just interested in that shit. The ruins, right. you know what I mean. You talk about all. Oh, I, I always joke, yo. There's always a rapper that's gonna start rapping about pyramids. That shit might be me, right? Because <laughs> I'm into that shit, man. You know, I'm into like e Egyptian culture and things. So we we ended up 2008. We lined it up. We got to the morning of that spring equinox, which is September because it's in South America. September is spring equinox, and um, it was just an inspiring moment, you know. And I had recorded. Um, so I had two mixtapes in the interim, which I didn't talk about because you, you can't really find them anymore. I, I, I got to put them back out somehow, some way. But the second one was, was Loose Lips 1 and Loose Lips Volume 2. I called it the, the Unsampleables because the whole shit is beats that I made out of all the artists you're never supposed to sample. I mean, like right. Michael Jackson, 
Jimi Hendrix, Frank yeah, that Sinatra. one. Jimi Hendrix. So that's that possible beats. That riff is from Voodoo Child, you know. Right. Oh. And uh, and uh, yeah, all I did was just put like a kick and a snare to it to give it a little right. little bump, and, and <laughs> it was dope you know. regardless, man. Yeah, and I loved it, and um, it's very like it's got a very primal feel to it, very primal message to it, right. and um. I wasn't planning on making a video that day. We had we had our camera, and I I, I knew I was gonna like just like spit a verse or something just to like use for like you know content. And we got up, then I was all inspired and shit, and I just turned to my man and I was like, um, which by the way is my man. He's he's also from Miami. He's he used to go by Wavelength, and he had a group called Council of the Sun back in Miami. So shout out to the Council of the Sun. They used to do their thing out there. Well, my man Wave, I was like, yo, man. I was like, here, just shoot. He's like, what? I was like, yo, just shoot. And I didn't I didn't even have the uh the music. I just spit that whole shit a cappella. Oh, so you spit a cappella and it lined exactly with the and, beat. I, and I lined it up later. Yeah, and I actually edited that whole video because I got a little skills with editing and stuff too. So yeah, I just I just went around. We went around probably like for about a half hour. Yo, get me here, get me here, right. get me here. You know what I mean? Walked around a bit, maybe saw something else. Yo, get me here real quick. And then when I got back to the States, got back to Queens. I was living in Queens at the time. I just chopped that bitch up, put it on YouTube. It's funny, that one never really got a lot of love. Um, I don't know why. I think it's an amazing video. Yeah, I've it's a dope video, bro. Super and, proud and of it. <laughs> the way that it's shot, it's got like an old school feel to it. Uh-huh. Like if you yeah, shot that yeah. like in the 60s, like somebody uh -huh. was backpacking in the 60s through Machu Picchu. That was really yeah. dope. That's really because it's an older camera, you know. I mean, this is 2008. Right. We didn't have a uh, 1080 HD on right. our phones yet, you know what I'm saying? So, um, but yeah, I, I love that song. I love that video. The whole, the whole shit, the unsampleables is 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 crazy. I got to find a way to put it out. The whole thing was, I mean, I can't make money off of it. I never did. I gave it out for free. I actually gave it out as a free download, and actually blew the fuck up. Like people from all over the world were actually hitting <laughs> me up, like in Europe and South America. Everyone was like, "Yo, I downloaded this shit. Yo, I love this shit." Da da da. It was dope. That was actually kind of one of my first little like solo. I thought a mini hit of mine when I put right. that. that and shit. you were also wearing the like the the Peruvian hat too while yeah. you were walking through. Because yeah. <laughs> I I bought that from a lady for like ten. They call it soles, which is like three American dollars. I bought it for ten soles from this little lady. Dope. I was like, yeah, yo, okay, you're definitely repping. I was in there, yo. <laughs> I was in there, yo. I was in the moment. Yeah, that was <laughs> yo. That's a life changer, though. If anyone ever gets a chance, Machu Picchu was will change your life, man. That shit was. All inspiring when you get up yeah, there. I'm on the go, bro. Yeah, you should go, man. It's it's really not that expensive. That's why I always tell people. People think it's this big thing, but when you go to South America, as long as you get the the, the flights in advance, right. get a good price, kind of like recover from that. By the time it's time to go, I, I went for 17 days. I brought a thousand dollars with me, and I didn't even use it all because oh, okay. because the the uh, conversion is three to one. Right. So I had basically I had three thousand dollars out there. Oh, I mean, wow. and I mean. Eating like a king, steaks right. and ceviche and bottles of wine and beer <laughs> and you know, like everything. You know, and shit, man. I still have money when I came home. That's the beautiful thing about South America. You go down there, you, you feel like a king, you know? So you ever think of going to like a place like Puma Punku or, or someplace like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all on my list. I mean, so that was 08, 09, me and my man's same crew, and my, my man G has joined us. We went to um Egypt, right? So we Patra went, Jones. <laughs> the Patra Jones, yeah. We, That's we what I was going to talk about. Yeah, that was the next yeah. thing. Right, we chat, and then that one we actually planned. That was like, all right, well, we got to do a follow-up. So I shot a video in the Giza pyramids, and I'm just into that shit, man. I, I, I believe that there's a there's a whole human history outside of what we've been taught in school. I think that, that they're all interconnected. I think, um, you know, the, the next year, 2010, we, I didn't shoot a video that year, but we went to all the Mayan stuff in Guatemala and Tikal and uh, Belize and all these places. And got, you see all these things and you realize how old they are. And they're probably older than the, the contemporary historians are even telling you. And uh, I really think that, I don't know if you're hip to this dude, Graham Hancock, but I've been reading yeah. him for a long time, since before he was like a guest on all these shows. And uh, he talks about this a lot, about how um, he believes like there were societies and civilizations that were advanced before the Ice Age, and basically when the Ice Age came, it just and then they kind of had to retreat. And then when the Ice Age ended abruptly, there were huge floods. Right? They talk about this in all our religions. The, the, the mud the, floods, the, the big flood, 
right. and and the world had to basically start over. And right. you know, the world forgot itself. And, and you see those places, and it's it, it, it just changes your life, bro. That's the best that's the best I can say. Do you know about Tartaria? Have you heard about Tartaria? No, I don't think so. Look, look that up. If you're really interested in like ancient like history, look up Tartaria. All right, well, send me a link or something after this. I'll send you a link. Um, right, I, did a, I did a uh, interview. I'll send you the link to the interview with this uh, female named Michelle Gibson that looks up this this uh, ancient civilization that created like this empire called Tartaria, uh -huh. and it spanned from like Asia and Europe all the way here to the Americas. Really. And a lot yeah. of like the ancient structures, even the stuff that you see like in Washington, like those ancient buildings, mm -hmm. it tell us we built. She, she found like evidence that it was built way before and that we just kind of moved into them. Word. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll send that to you. We the next, yeah, we the next yeah. video, bro, that I want to talk about, bro, that really got me. You, you dropped this video because I was I'm ex-military was uh, easy with eyes closed. What was oh, the concept? Yeah. What was the concept behind that, bro? Because I, I, the, the, it's a deep song and the cinematography was really dope. Yeah, that's another one that I felt like it was a sleeper. That one um, was also from the Unsampleables. I don't know if you caught the sample, but that's the Beatles. Um, right. um, Strawberry Fields, right? And I made that beat. That beat is so dope. So I love that beat. <laughs> um, but yeah, the whole idea was um, living is, is live. We, we, I took the phrase living is easy with eyes closed, right? Like, and I and at that time I was just I mentioned military, but I just felt like, you know, I think a lot of people they blindly go into the military and they don't really realize what it is that they're getting into. I mean, I have the utmost respect for veterans, so I just want to say that carefully, right? I don't want people to think I'm anti, but I think that they kind of get they walk into a situation they don't really understand, you know, and 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 they're, they're a lot of you just end up being a pawn for the military and it's not just the u.s it's every country right you are fighting i tell my kids war is a, is like this imagine your principal and the principal of other school they don't like each other and then they start fighting because one wants more pencils and erasers than the other and then they use you guys to kill each other to get the pencils and erasers right that's to me that's that's what's happening like i said i don't mean that as uh, any disrespect to anybody that's military I, I appreciate your service and everybody else Oh, um, but that song in particular is about that. Is I actually use my boy uh, Jesse, who's like this like pretty boy. He's a DJ. Uh, actually, he does he's pretty big like EDO label and stuff like that now. Um, but yeah, I used him and yeah, that's dope. He's like a, he's like a he's a military person. He gets, right. he he basically enlists and then he and then like as the song progresses, he's in war. We actually got up and went out to Long Island. I remember it like four in the morning to shoot that on the beach so it looked like we were out in the desert but we were actually right. just on jones beach it was know. dope dude that uh, shit was the way dope. We, uh -huh. and it was kind of cool because it was like misty and stuff that morning and then and then the whole shit twists because i talk about in the song and then he ends up losing his leg right and then the director who was a who did that one i only did one video with him he's dope this guy aldous davison uh was able to we put like a green like sleeve over his leg from the kneecap down and he was able to to just make it disappear right. <laughs> like so it looked like he just had yeah. a nub your you know or two nubs right and my girl Issa Frias who's a dope actress and good friend of mine <laughs> she she's like playing his wife yelling at him so, yeah right. it's that it, I like to make my videos like you kind of touched on I think those are works of art too I think a lot of people just like kind of go through the motions oh I got money. I'm in front of my benzo. You know, here's the trains. Whatever. You know. I mean, it's however you aspect you want to put it. It usually tends to be pretty kind of like the same thing, or just like that same angle with the lights, and you know what I mean. Right. But it's not. There's not much thought into the, like the substance of the video. So I've always tried to give my videos a a, a spin. You know, so I don't like to just go out and just spit at the mic. That's boring to me. Like I'm right. Like, did you like, did you do any research? Did you talk to any like ex-military people? The reason why I'm asking, bro, be is that the reason like that song really hit me hard is when I joined, mm -hmm. my reason was because I, I felt like I wasn't going anywhere in life specifically. Mm -hmm. I had a kid on the way and it was a means to win. And let me make some money, see if I can get like a Montgomery GI Bill so I can get like a degree later on. Mm -hmm. But the way that that character is looking like lifeless, 
when he's sitting on the couch and everything is happening all around him. Mm-hmm. That's how, like a zombie. That's how like I felt. And, yeah. the, and the situation with like the his girlfriend or his wife in, in, in the video arguing with him because uh-huh. possibly he's not himself. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. He yeah changed. Exactly. He's not the same man, because when you go through training, mm-hmm. you're really tra- you're training to kill. Yeah. I don't whatever branch you're, you're in, even if you become a cook in the military, you still have to go through basic training and you still have to learn how to use a weapon and you still have mm-hmm. to learn how to kill. And if yeah. shit hits the fan. You're cooking burgers one moment and now you're out in the field fighting a battle Mm -hmm. because that's who you are. You're a tool and you captured that like so perfectly. So did you do any research? Like I wouldn't say research, but I would say my my, my little brother, he he ended up being a Marine. He didn't see he didn't see uh, wartime because he was during like the late 90s. It was was peaceful. But uh, I saw the changes in him. Just like you said, just coming back from boot camp and like the mentality changes and things like that. So I think maybe that probably influenced some of that. Um, and I've had other friends over the years who've been military. My good friend John Miller ended up being a medic and ended up going to Afghanistan and all that. And he, I mean, he would just send us photos that he probably mm-hmm. shouldn't even be sending us, but things that we he would see out there. And man, like the, the things people go through. So like, God bless anybody who goes through that and they come out and yeah, you're able to just re assimilate to society you know like after you know you saying they're changing you mentally just by what they're kind of preaching and enforcing upon you right and then what you see and experience you know it's 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 not for the the weak of heart you know so yeah i i, I didn't really do research i would say but that's just from my own experiences with people that I know and right. love that had went through it and probably told me some things and I just wanted to yeah <laughs> you did a great job dude I'll tell you that right now man I, I, <laughs> again like I'm just gonna say it's called easy with eyes closed so anybody get a chance it's under Mike Nichols or is it under uh Nichols I think I switched I think I switched at, I think I switched most of my YouTube so it just says Mike Nichols just so it matches okay. yeah so yeah. I'm pretty sure people need so to watch that video that's a dope video yeah the you next can just video. go to my yeah. YouTube. Anybody that's listening, YouTube uh, slash Mike Nichols, M-I-C Nichols, and everything we're talking about is on in there. What's All right, word. Yeah, you definitely need to see it. And then there's another video that people need to see, which I even looked it up to see if anybody's ever done this before. Nobody's ever done this. I looked it up. Rappers who skydive and rap. So you have a song <laughs> called Sky City with the, with a singer uh, named Teen AF, which I is as fuck, I would imagine. That's what it stands for. Um what was the concept behind that, dude? Or was it something that spur of the moment you decided, oh, let me just rap while I'm skydiving? Okay, it's funny. All right, so because we've been we've been talking about this, I could I could go backtrack many years. There, me and my boy Diddy uh, had a concept years ago where we were going to do that together. We, okay, I, not maybe not so much rap, but like jump out of a plane, and we had a song idea called Crash Landing, whatever the fuck. But it kind of it got it never happened. It never even came close. And flash forward, I guess twenty years or so, right? Eight, fifteen, twenty years. Um, I had recorded that song. And by the way, that song is a little out of my normal vein. The beat almost touches on like a, I'll be honest, like almost like it's kind of trapish, I guess, right? The way that the beat, but it's dope. I thought it was really dope. I don't. Dude, it's dope. Me. I mean, I don't. To me, I don't classify stuff like, oh, this is a trap. Yeah. Beat. But yeah. to me, like it's a beat and uh, it, the lyrics come in and then I make my judgment of like if I like the song or I don't. Word. And it's dope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's a little bit it's a little different out of my normal boom bat vein, I would say. Right. But I love it. I'm very proud of that song. I think it's one of my greatest lyrical songs that I've written. I wrote the, the hook for that for that dude TNAF. And I guess it's t- I never asked him for his ass fuck, but I just imagined to not not ass fuck, ass fuck. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I got, yeah, you gotta cl- you gotta clarify. Unfortunately, man, who is actually by trade a very dope producer, R and B writer. He works out of the studio that I work with. I work. I work that album. I actually recorded in L A. at this studio called Westlake, with which you're not familiar. Is legendary. I mean, Michael Jackson did all his shit there. Rage Against the Machine. When wow. I've been there, uh, Usher was there. Uh, Suge Knight was there at one point years ago when I was there. Um, Warren G. I mean, everybody's in that. Moment. Missy Elliott did her shit there. Oh, dope. And my homie, through the years, I had become friends. 
just a quick backstory. I became friends with DJ Wiz, who was Kid and Plays DJ. Wiz hooked me up with this dude, Al, trying to help me with the links. I talk about this in the book. And then years later, Al, who was a producer and engineer with Salt and Pepper, Kid and Play, like he did all Salt and Pepper shit, first of all. Like he, as an engineer, he mixed all that shit that we all know, Super Dupe, all that shit. And uh, he bought, ended up taking that money and buying it into Westlake. So we just became boys over the years, really, man. He just looks out for me. So, God, what up, Al Mashara? Um, he had me, I recorded that whole album. And I had a singer I didn't like. And um, I initially on there, I recorded. And I said, I didn't like it. It just wasn't, I wasn't really feeling, it wasn't touching what I was trying to get when I wrote it. And my man Al was like, yo, my boy, Tina, well, his real name isn't Tina, but he's like, he can come in and crush that in two seconds if you want. I'll call him right now. I'm like, yeah, all right, bet. So he came up, literally, boom, boom. Just did it in sequences, pop, pop, like this. You like it like this, pop, pop, pop. He wrote, like, the little outro part, so I gave him a little writing credit, you know, to at the end. Um, so now, here we are. It's mixed. I'm getting ready to release the album, so I'm doing my videos and stuff. I like to do my videos in advance if I can. And I'm in L.A. because my, my wife is from L.A., so we go out there a lot. Uh, we... You know, we actually got basically a little crash spot that we can go whenever we want. So I spent a lot of time in LA. And uh, I'm sitting here trying to figure out how to record a video while I'm out there. Sky City. And I keep, I had this idea where like I wanted to like climb a skyscraper, not like on the outside, but like up the steps and then somehow get on the rooftop of a skyscraper, maybe get a drone or something. I don't know. I had this idea. But I couldn't put it together. It was really hard to convince, try to convince somebody to let me do that shit. You know, there's, there's I believe it or not, there's legal uh, regulations and things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's liability. Going on top, go on top of skyscrapers. Who knew, right? So <laughs> I'm like sitting here and I'm like, oh, man, what am I going to do? And then Sky City. And then it popped in my head, that idea I had with the links. I'm like, and then I'm like, damn, I'm like, should I do it? And uh, so I just, I just looked it up real quick. And then I found a... I found a skydiving company, California Coastal, they're called. They're a little bit north of Malibu. And I called them and I told them my idea. And they're like, yeah, we'll do that. We'll record you. Like, there's only, like, yeah, $250. Done. Word. They're like, they're like, the only thing is, like, are you going to be able to perform? He's like, because we've had people try to do this before and they get up there and they freak out and they don't do it. I'm like, yeah, I'll get it done. Don't worry. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I didn't tell my wife because she would, and shit her pants and tell me not to do it. So I just, right. I just, I just left. <laughs> I just, I had some. I said I'm shooting a video, but I didn't tell her what I was doing. All right, right. Smart, smart. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I just told my man, as my best friend. I said, "Yo, just you know, I'm going skydiving. I doubt anything's gonna happen, but just in case, I want you to know, <laughs> like, so somebody knows, right? Right. And um, I put him as like the emergency contact. <laughs> hmm. uh, so yeah, we went over there and. Um, Got over there and it's just like, yeah, man. Um, I had to like just keep like preparing myself mentally, like you know what I'm saying. Like, it, I had never done that shit. I never skydived. I never bungee jumped. I never did no shit like that. I always, I always wanted to, but when you get up there and you're in a plane, a little tiny ass plane, and you're eighteen thousand feet in the air, bro, eighteen thousand feet, and you're going two hundred miles an hour, and you're looking at this little rattly rinky dink door that you can pop open and i was attached to it dude because i had never done it. you have to you have to go tandem but it's still scary as fuck i don't give yeah. a fuck if you shit I, I i haven't done it i'm i was scared watching the video yeah <laughs> and uh yeah man and i was funny because i was in there and i just kept like spitting my verse spitting my verse in my head it's like yo you all right you look kind of nervous and i'm like nah i just i just got to keep doing this because when we're out there i don't have time to have a hiccup i got one chance one chance to nail it. Once again, I have no music. I had no earbuds or nothing. So I'm doing this acapella, falling out of the fucking sky. And he's like, yo, he's like, don't worry about it, man. I got you. I'll get you in the situation. As soon as I have the camera on you, I'm going to tap you on the arm. And you just go time. I just remember I got to the edge. And you got your feet on the wheel. And you're just looking down. You're like, oh, my God. And I was like, I got to just go with this. Like, just, <laughs> I, I just got to trust on me. You know, mm. like that's that's his part, you know. And we just rolled out. You see the video. 
as soon as he got me steady, he was like, feeling him. And then I was just like, da 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 I got just... Dude, I mean, it was seamless, bro. It was seamless. Yeah. It looked like you had done this like a few times as practice, but no. no. I, I just, <laughs> one time, in and out. It's funny, my boy, uh, Luis, who, uh, my man, we call him Fuego. Uh, he directed that, like the actual edits and stuff. And uh, he's like, you know, he's he was back in Brooklyn. And he's like, yo, man, send me, he's like, send me, send me the footage, man. I got to try to line it up. Let me see how you did. And then he called me. He's like, yo, he's like, you smashed it. He's like, I, I lined up the first word. He's like, the whole shit all the way through, the <laughs> timing, everything. He's like, I didn't have to do nothing, yo. Like, you just nailed it, yo. Yeah. I, I was like, glad, yeah, man. I was, I was just so focused, you know. I was just like, and that's no how choice. I am, man. Yeah, I'm just like that in general. Like, if I'm, if I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna fucking do it, yo. I'm not gonna sit here. And, I'm not gonna sit here and, and fuck around, waste my time, waste my money, you know, waste this opportunity. I'm gonna nail it, yo. So yeah, I, the only thing I could have happened is if I had a brain fart at the moment, it's like, right. oh shit, what's that first line? Because once right. I got the first line, it's a boom, right, right. But uh. Yeah, it was cool, man. That was amazing, man. And then I want to go again because I didn't really get to like just enjoy it. You know what I mean? Like, oh, so, so you want to do it again without rhyming? <laughs> I just, yeah, I just, I just want, now I just want to go try it, man. I just want to go try it again because it was fun. Actually, I can't front, man. It was it was actually a lot of fun, but I didn't really get to just take it all in because by the time I had finished spitting my verse, he pulled the parachute. Right, and then we and it was a wrap. I got you. Yeah. So the the song itself, like I find it a very empowering song. What's the concept behind that track? Yeah, um, it's just um it's it's really just kind of a motivational song. Like like I just it's just kind of I really wanted to push people to just not not give up when times get tough. I think that I I mean that actually had that song that was like right during COVID and shit was fucked up, but, you know, when I penned it, you know, and it's just like, I just wanted to give some people something to hold on to. And I've had a lot of people say, yo, man, when I'm down, I'll just, I'll just put that shit on and it, it puts me right. You know what I mean? So yeah, I, I it's a like, dope song. I felt like I did, but that was it, Rand. It's just really just, just <clears throat> believe in yourself, I think, and push through no matter what. Like, don't rely on nobody but you. You know, when you're in those moments and and, and just uh, believe that it's just going to keep going upward, you know, and that's 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 my general mentality in general. But we all go through it. I mean, you know, I got moments I'm down, but, you know, that's, that's what that song is meant for. When you're in that moment to kind of help you shake loose. Word up, brother. So to get back oh, to money, money. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Finish I want to get props to the to the, to the beat maker. That's Mark Swing out of uh, Stockholm, Sweden, who I work with. He so he did that one, and he did uh he did the other one, which I call Joe Perkins. This is on the album, which is super dope. Right. B side sleeper, uh, and then we got some stuff in the works right now. Shout out to Mark Swing, yo. What up, Sweden? <laughs> <laughs> so I want to get back into Mung uh, Money Hungry Bastards MHB. Yes, uh, do you guys have any compilations out? Any any material? Or are you releasing anything like that in the future? So MHB is funny because we talk about this all the time. We've never released an actual album under the name money hungry bastards we have tons of collaborations which we're continuing to do <clears throat> where we're all featuring on each other's shit we had a string of mixtapes which the dopest one you can find online um it's just called mhb you will remember us and that featured that was at the height of I think what we were when we were really really working on everything and that time I think we had like 50 MCs and another 15 or so producers from around the world that were all involved in you know part of the MHB crew and that's a really dope collab so I don't know if you got a chance to check that you, I know like a, a head like you like you'll eat that shit up it's, it's oh without a doubt it's it's fucking dope oh um, we have been really trying to get together and make a MHB album, which really features like who we consider right now to be the seven main MCs, which is me, Mr. Cord, Citizen Kane, Witchcraft, Dick Dashley, Masai Bay, and Lifelong. Um, and then also bringing some of the other MCs to like throughout the album, but like really try to like center around us seven, just cause it's just hard to organize so many fucking people. 
Oh, um, so we've been working on that concept. Mr. Cord wants to. He's a, one of my favorite producers, uh, and he's he wants to just produce the whole thing like a la RZA. So we're just kind of waiting for him to drop us that beat file. God willing, it'll be this year. And then in the meantime, um, so me and life right now, me and Lifelong are working on a track and talking about possibly making a whole EP. Um. With this dude, Nom Nom Chopsky. I never heard of him, but his beats are dope, bro. Out of uh, he's it sounds familiar. He's out of the Netherlands, you know. Uh, I guess, and there's so many dope beat makers out of Europe. By the way, it's insane. I work with a lot of dope, just European MC uh, producers that just make absolute fucking fire. And it's funny because they're just hungry to work with dope MCs from from New York, from from the states, you know. That you know, and it's just a dope fusion. So. You got that, and then me and um, Kiza, who was an MHB producer, but he's actually out of Serbia, out of Bel Belgrade, Serbia. Um, and I met him through Lifelong many years ago, and we did Busy Man's Playlist and a bunch of my my favorite tracks that I've done. But we, this is our first time we're doing an EP together. Uh, that's called The Impressionist, and the first single is coming out, actually, Fall Goes Well. I was going to try March, but probably April at this point. The first single is going to drop. I'm going to keep dropping singles over the summer. And that shit is insane. I got a whole bunch of new big special guests on there and things that I'm super excited about. So, Word up. So, yeah, man. Mm -hmm. Watch out for that. So listen, Mike, this is the last portion because I know you got fam and you got things to do. Um, Let's get into the book and the LP bars for days. All right? Yes, sir. So... You don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. I understand it might be a sensitive issue. But I grew up, me and my brother, with a single mother. And you open up the book, which I thought was dope, with uh, This One's For You, Mom. How instrumental was your mother in your life and your, your artistic career? My mom's, uh, man, my mom's is, uh, well, well, I say was my best friend. Um, she passed away 2020, uh, right during like the height of COVID. R.I.P., uh, man. Yeah, thank you. It's been difficult, man. It's been probably the hardest few years of my life because that's how close we are. I mean, when you are with a single mother, then as you know, uh, that bond is is pretty incredible, especially when, as being a son, I feel like, because they end up leaning on you for a lot of things that they would have if they had a, a dude around, right? You know, so uh, it just becomes like a different kind of dynamic in a lot of ways. You know, uh, my mom went through a lot, which I touch on in the book. Uh, during that time, during the 80s, during my youth, um, you know, she was having a lot of <clears throat> she was having a lot of drug issues and things like that. She got into drugs and things. You know, one of her boyfriends, who was like a, a dad to me at the time, he was also flipping keys, like big time, and it, it ended up affecting her and had me basically like in and out of like different family members' homes for a while, things like that. So that's a this book, man. When you get into it, I didn't really reveal it at the beginning, but. Um, I wrote this. I started writing this before we ever knew she was sick. But I, as I was in the middle of it, we found out she was sick with cancer, and she actually passed before I finished it. Um, and I really, as I really delved into my own life and the things that uh, you know, affected me, I really started to realize how much she really was like the B character in my life through basically the first forty some odd years of my life, and um, so that's how I established her and that's how the book rides out. Everything I do, whether I'm spitting mics and I'm in the studios and da da da, eventually it tails back to seeing like what's popping with moms, you know? And, uh, yeah, she was very supportive, man. She was very proud. Um, I had a, her best friend who's like an auntie to me recently. She reached out of the blue and she was just like, you know, I don't know if your mom ever told you this, but she was really proud that you just followed your path as an artist, even though you had opportunities that could have been financially definitely more lucrative. You know, long story short, like while I was in Florida, I became through a time one of the management levels of of the improv comedy club, Miami Improv and stuff. I was the bar manager. They actually gave me an opportunity before I left Florida. They wanted me to be like one of the main managers at that new hard rock one that they had built. A pretty good pay, right? And I and I was like, nah, I'm going to Brooklyn. <laughs> right, I'm going. To, and everyone's like, why are you leaving? Like you had, a, I had a dope condo, dope ride, 
girliest galore. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm out <laughs> with Dave Chappelle and shit all the time. Why are you leaving? And huh. I left because my heart told me, follow my craft. That's more important to be an artist. And yeah, so that was that was dope to hear, like, retroactively from, from her bestie. Basically, like, she was proud of you that you, you didn't just basically sell out. And you did. She was just always, she was always my number one fan. So, okay. yeah, man, I miss, I miss her. I think about her a lot. And uh, it was good therapy because, like I said, writing that book was, it let out a lot about me, but just a lot about everything. You know, it was like, I got to like really, I got to really just like reset with my life after that. It's like, it's all here. Right. Y'all want to know me? I really don't hold no punches. I think some people didn't like some of the things I said, but I, I really made it a point to be as truthful as my memory could serve. I didn't remember something. I would double, I would talk to people and interview people to make sure I had the facts. As you talk about years and years and years, you might get some stuff wrong. And I talk about that up front, like in the intro, you know, but I really did my best to, to really call it how it was and talk about the most instrumental experiences. And I think, uh, I think once it was over, it was just good for me. But yes, I think some people didn't, <laughs> some people weren't excited about some of the things I said, but in my, in my mind, it was like this, well, are they true? Right. Yes. Then if you didn't like, what you did, should you have done those things? Should you have said those things? Because they're true. It's not like I just went and made them up. These are things that actually happened or actually said. Like, pretty much verbatim at times. <laughs> you know? Oh, right. like, oh man, you, you couldn't just forget about it? And I, well, it, I, it made it was part of the story. I had All to right. tell I had to tell my story. So that's bars for days, you know? And then so the LP goes along with it. Some of the stories, some of the verses, you actually will hear in in like paragraph form throughout the book. Um, some of the music that we've talked about, some of the music on the album, I will talk about being in the studio or me writing that stuff, what I was going through while I was writing. So you're, you're really experienced. For me, this book, I call it an ethnography because it's it represents culture. It represents hip hop culture. It represents, it's not just hip hop in general. It's not just from one perspective. It's it's this generation. We grew up, and I believe this, we grew up parallel to hip hop. Like I said in the beginning of this conversation, you know? And um, I think it's just important to see like how pivotal our generation was towards the world, society. I think hip hop really changed the world in a lot of ways. I, I, I attribute, I think it, it was directly, I would say, responsible in a lot of ways for us finally electing a black president. I think it made race racial tensions dissipate in a lot of ways. We we grew together. I'm talking about the hip hop that we've been preaching on, which is the sub, the stuff with substance, you know. And I just wanted to really encapsulate that in bars for days and talk about that and just also how our generation, on top of just hip hop and all, that, just really transitioned the world into this new generation of social media and computers and cell phones. Like we grew up and that wasn't it. By the time we were grown, it was here, you know, and we, we helped usher that in. So I think this Gen X, late Gen X to early millennial, I'll say there's like a, there's like a subgenre between the two that kind of links together. Late seventies, early to mid eighties. We were so pivotal in society and I don't think we get enough uh, respect for for what what we were what we did what we went through what we, what we brought to this world so that's that was the point of that book man bars for days man okay and so the the book is 300 and over 390 pages mm -hmm. it runs parallel with the uh, with the lp uh, the lp's like what 14 tracks i think it's 14 yeah yeah, yeah i think so <laughs> per perfect number because you know Again, you, attention span, you do a t 20 track, people are probably not going to listen to the last six tracks once they listen to the first, probably mm -hmm. 10, 12 or whatever. Let's get into some of the tracks. We already talked about Sky City. I wanted to get into a lot of other tracks that are very, that I found very empowering. One is Overcome, the concept behind that. Yeah. Uh, overcome, uh, once again, like I was going through a lot of adversity at that time. Um, and I think, 
once again, I think I just, I just, that's me in general. I just like to be that catalyst for people to preach in a way to in my music as coolly and as subtly as I can to let you know, like, you know, we got options. We can push forward. We can persevere, you know? So Sky City, Overcome, they kind of have a similar message, but Overcome is tells specific stories. So it's two verses. The first verse actually really goes through the links and like what happened between me and my mans, you know, like, and, um, you know, that was, that was something I had to personally push through and recreate myself. And then verse two, it's funny because that was actually a rewrite because when I was initially writing it, my, one of my best friends, Lawrence Leathers, uh, got killed um, by a woman that he knew and, and another dude. They jumped him. And it was he was a prolific drummer and artist and a great friend in the community. He was just a great, he's just one of those dudes like larger than life. Even though he wasn't that big, he was just, he was a big soul. And uh, that shit really affected me, man. So I actually decided right before I got the studio to scratch the second verse that I had. I don't remember actually what it was at this point. And I just wrote this verse from my man, Lawrence. And that's what that song is about. Um, and that 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 beat, too, is, is Kiza. So that's a prelude to what's happening coming up with The Impressionist. He's just no doubt. He's an amazing. One of my favorite beat makers I've ever worked with. He's incredible. So, Okay, so and. On your on your this LP bars for days, you do collabs with some people, hip hop royalty. You did one with uh, Timbo King on Things to Come. What was that like working with like a legend like that? Uh, it was dope, man. Because so I I was initially initially linked to Timbo um, through my man Rodney Kendrick, who's a producer and a piano jazz pianist by trade, um, who. He had known me through years by seeing Nickel and Dime play, so he had learned to appreciate and became supportive of me. And it's funny because I hit him up and I was like, I was trying to find a a cameo for a different song, which we'll touch on in a minute. And um, it didn't work out. So I hit him up because I knew he knew some of the people I was kind of interested in that were from Wu-Tang and shit. I had actually reached out to Ghost because Ghost had put out one of those posts. Yo, let's work. Hit me in the DM. And I saw him. Right. I hit him up. And fool wanted eight stacks. Oh, and I'm shit. Like, I'm like, I, I ain't got eight stacks for you, homie. Right. So I hit up my man, Rodney, because I knew he knew him. And he linked me to Timbo. And he's like, yo, Timbo knows everybody. Tim, if anyone could talk to him. So me and Timbo linked on the strength of that. And I was like, well, yo, that's we should we should do one first before anything. I mean, I think that that's I, when you when you're a real MC and, and you meet another real MC. I feel like that should be the initial conversation over the mic. Like, yo, let's uh, let's level up. Like, right. I think for him, he didn't really know who I was. So I think he wanted to see before he starts referring me to people to see, you know, who I am as an artist, as an MC. So he's like, oh, yeah, let's do him. So um, showed him a few beats. He picked that beat, which was Mr. Chord's beat. It's funny, Cord always says, he's like, I showed that beat to 100 people. No one wanted to do it. I always thought it was dope as fuck. Right. Timbo heard it. He's like, yo, that's the one. I'm like, yeah. Okay. Two days later, he came back. Verse. Boom. Done. Fire. Right. He's Timbo King. Right. The grind the grind God help you find God, Timbo King likes to say. <laughs> now we people. yeah, because But at that time, we were just new to each other. So now I'm like, all right, this is my chance to show and prove. You know what I'm saying? So... I basically took the same amount of time, 48 hours, wrote my verse. I got a home studio, luckily, so I just went and just recorded my shit. And then I was, I didn't want to have a hook, so to speak. So what I did was I found all these, like, I like to find these old, like, sci-fi, uh, like, black and white, public domain kind of kind of cuts. And yeah, I like, found too those, cheesy shit, you know, like, yeah, some cool shit, though. <laughs> I, mean, I just wanted to have that real hip-hop feel to it you know i didn't want it to be some like happy hook or nothing so i, I found all that shit put it in and i was like bomb i was like here bro and he was like oh shit and then uh a couple of days later he called me called me up and uh I, that could segue to the next to the next song if you want to talk about yeah that. so i wanted to talk about <laughs> this one because it's accompanied with a video which when i put this in um interview out I'm going to open up the interview with this video and it's uh, El Matador or El Matador, however you want to pronounce it, with Method Man. Like, how did that, how did that happen? That's a legend too. 
Yeah, so that is really on the strength of Timbo. So Timbo, after taking this track and seeing that I'm legit, like I'm the real deal, he's like, yeah, I can fuck with you. Uh, he actually, like I said, I was trying to talk to Ghost, so he actually tried to reach out to Ghost first, and Ghost was just like, nah, like eight stacks or nah. <laughs> um, so he called me up about three, four days later, and he was like, yo, man, he's like, Ghost ain't going to do it. And I'm like, all right. And he's like, he's like, well, how would you feel about meth? And I was just like, <laughs> huh? <laughs> you know, like, like, I didn't even think that shit was like, Ghost I thought was attainable for some reason, but Meth, because he's a movie star, I, and it turns out Meth is just the coolest motherfucker on earth. He's just yeah. really down for a lot of young brothers that are trying to do their thing. He's already made it, and he's just, he's just he's just completely open to giving back. So he got on the phone with me, which is just surreal to me. Me, Meth, and Timbo King on the telephone. And he was like, look, man, he's like, I make X amount of money on power per episode. He's like, I'm good. He's like, you, honestly, you can't even afford what I charge for a verse. He was just straight up. And he was like, so you wrote with my man's Timbo King. You wrote with my man's Rodney. He's like, I got you. He said, free 99. He's like, don't even worry about it. So he looked out on the strength of wow, that's dope, man. <laughs> of my people, our mutual friends, but also, I mean, because he respected my craft as an artist. Because the track that I gave him already had my verse on there. I had already recorded my verse. Right. So it was just open for him to do the opening verse, and uh, he heard it, he respected it, and he was with it. So a couple of weeks later, I, I the one thing I regret is I didn't get to go to the studio with him because um, he's he's just all over the place. But when he had some time, he just went into his lab in Staten Island. Which he calls the meth lab, and uh, I can always text yo mess in the lab, mess in the lab. He's doing, he's doing, he's doing. It. Oh shit! And uh, what I heard when he finished, Inspector Deck was over there too. He was like the first right. one to hear it before me. <laughs> Damn, it would have been dope to have Inspector Deck on it too. <laughs> I know, man. I mean, I know. Maybe I mean this is maybe in the future, right? Right, right, right. Oh, um, but yeah, man, it was it was just incredible experience. And then side note, I want just want to give props to uh, my man, not my man, but. One of my heroes, MF Doom, he was actually supposed to be on that track. Um, he was the the first MC that I reached out to, and um, he, through other mutuals, agreed to do it, which was amazing. I didn't get a chance to talk to him, but he said he was going to do it, and that was literally days, if not weeks, before COVID just blew the fuck up, and yeah. we all we all kind of lost touch. And um, when things started to kind of like calm down around summertime. I started reaching out, like, yo, what's up? What's up with Doom? And they were like, yo, he ain't feeling good. He, we don't really know. He's just not feeling good. So I, I kind of had the inside scoop that something was going on with him. Oh, man. Damn. And uh, and then that, I think it was around Halloween, or was it actually on yeah. Halloween? They yeah. Uh -huh. they, yeah, yeah. They announced that he had passed, and I was just like, fuck. So meth, meth was my number two choice, believe it or not. But, uh, yeah, it was crazy because I was just sitting there, and I'm like, Hanging with my mans, and we were listening. I, I showed him the whole album, and then it's just one empty verse right there. And I'm like, damn, bro, like, what do I do? Like, it was supposed to be fucking doom. Like, what do right. I fucking do? And uh, he's like, well, who do you hear on there? I was like, I don't know, maybe like some Wu Cats or something like that. Yeah. And he's like, well, yo, hit him up. Just fucking what can't hurt. He's like, hit him up. So I, I just did, <laughs> and it, it worked out, bro. I mean, and I, to me, I, I think it's, I, I just take it as a testament to my artistry. Like, bottom line is, Doom would never say yes if he didn't respect what I was doing, even though it never happened. Timbo would have never said yes. Method Man would have never said yes and put their name, their legacy on the line if they didn't hear what I did and believe that this is something worth putting their name akin to. So, yeah, that shit came out. Um, I, I decided not to come out with it first as the first single because I just didn't want to like just rely on somebody else. I just really wanted to come out. So I did I did Rappers Don't Smile. Then I did Sky City. Then I did uh, The Phantom. which is The Phantom is dope, bro. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then I came out finally a year later and my distributor, shout out to DJ Sandman and Illsborough Records out of Tampa, Florida. Um, they they they're my distributor. Like, look, we'll do the single, but we think we should do some remixes and stuff to just give it a a fresh feel as we release it. So he got two producers, um, Op Super and Spontanola, who 
who I'd never heard of. They're both out of Tampa, but they're both dope as fuck. They made their remixes. My man Busy Thode, who's a super producer who's worked with everybody. Uh, he did like a rock because he's a guitar player by trade. So he did this like rock, almost Linkin Park kind of version with my man Keith Wookie scratching up on it. And so when we released that single, it was like a single EP, which you can find now on my Spotify and everything. It's dope. I like I like all of them. I like to just like bump around and listen to them. Most people, for whatever reason, the, the most popular one is OP Super. People really gravitated right. towards that one. It's got almost like a Dr. Dre feel <laughs> to that beat, right? Like it's got right. like a but it's a little less close to it, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, um, but they're all dope. And so when I when I did the video, for a while me and Meth were gonna meet up and do this video. Like that was the plan. And I was I was fired up. Like I was getting a crew together, da da da. The dude is busy, man. Meth is like the hardest working person dude, in the show me- business. I love Wu Tang, the crew. Uh, uh-huh. But Meth is the most talented, not because of an MC, but all the other things he does as an actor and all these other things. I mean, he's just like an he's just he's an artist, literally, like an artist. Mm-hmm. To teach. He's he was at the time he was making like two movies, working on a new Wu Tang album, working on uh you know, touring with them. I mean, so we could, we just couldn't link a date. And um, Timbo was like, yo, have you thought about just doing like an animation? Like that shit might, might be fire. Then you don't gotta like, you don't gotta wait. We just... So I was like, yeah, all right, fuck it. So um, I directed that whole thing. I got my man, Charles, U, we call him U, Ugas, who I also met initially through Lifelong. He does a lot of my album covers and stuff. And he had already done that single album cover and so I hit him up. I was like, yo, ooh, I'm like, what do you think about making this single into a cartoon? And he's like, well, I'm not an animator. I'm like, I know. I said, look, help me. Like, we'll come up with this whole lot concept. Help me draw it all out, the whole world. I'll find us an animator. I'll get it done. And he was like, bet. So I did the whole storyboard, literally an actual storyboard, like came up with the whole concept. Ooh, he helped me draw everything, the backgrounds, the different characters, the different positions. Like he put in a mad work, man. Oog is one of the most talented illustrators I know. Yeah, that and, video was fire. And um <laughs> I found an animator out of uh Indonesia on Fiverr who gave me a really nice price. He had done some like um anime stuff that I, I I was like, Yeah, I like this dude's work. Young kid, good prices. Kid knocked it out. And boom, there we go. He actually got this is definitely one of my highlights of my career. We act, we got it on MTV, uh, and we got it on MTV Yo, and we got it on uh, BET Jams. Both no fucking it, way, brother! On national television, that's multiple dope. Times, multiple times. So that was, uh, yeah, that whole thing was huge for me, man. The source talked about us. I mean, these are all like bucket list shit when you're right. a young MC coming up. So that's <laughs> where I am now. That's where I am now. And, Focus on this follow up, you know what I'm saying? So, right. So, yeah, like, I like I said, the video, the when I do this, when I release this, it's gonna start with the video. And for those, there's a MF Doom Easter egg, so look out for it. Yes, sir. You're paying homage, I would imagine, Absolutely. because he wasn't able to do it, but he was part of originally the project. So, I had to, um, I had to, I had to give him a salute for sure. I mean, no doubt. Honestly, real talk, he's my favorite MC. So it was, it was extremely. Devastating to know that I was right there and we never got to do it. So, um, but I mean, he's just one of the realest and lyrically talented motherfuckers that ever existed. And uh, I, I just wanted to show him some love because he did. He was gonna do that shit, you right. know. So, yeah, and it would have been dope. <laughs> Shout out to Doom. Yeah. Keep Wookie did make a. Uh, it's on the, that same on my YouTube channel. Keep Wookie made a, a a remix version where he took one of Doom's verses from. Uh, whatchamacallit, from Zarface, uh, Bombs is the track. He took he took one of his verses and mixed it in with me and Meth. So there is a version that exists. It's not really the version he recorded, right. but there's, it's a dope little like mashup remix if y'all want to check That's it. Dope. It's me, Meth, and Doom on one track together. It's fuck Clara. Yeah, yeah. R.I.P. MF Doom, man. Um, yes, sir. So let's end it on this, bro. You you What's coming up next for Mike Nichols, Dime Ops, MHB, if you want to repeat? So that people know like what's gonna happen next. Yeah, like I said, the next big uh release for me <clears throat> right now is the Impressionist album with me and Kiza. It's eight tracks, just me and him, uh production wise speaking, it's just him. Um 
I got some special guests. I'll, I'll drop you the super Easter egg that a lot of people don't know right now, bro. There's a track right now. This meth thing has propelled me into a lot of new opportunities. And uh, I got a track right now. It's me, uh, Rock This Monster, oh, shit. And, and Rod Digger. Oh, on the track. Shit. Okay, okay, okay. With, with, with Keith Wookie on the cuts. And it's a fucking banger. So I, I'm super excited. That's definitely going to be one of the singles that comes out. I got another track. It's um, it's an ode to New York. It's a little avant garde hip hop that one, but it's still fucking super dope. It's an ode to New York, and it's me, curious and lifelong. So that's another super fucking dope track. And then um, but some of the my favorite tracks are actually my solo ones. So the first one that's coming out um, it's called the Possibilities. Uh, I'm getting ready to shoot that video January. Uh, sorry, March seventeenth. And then uh, as soon as it's done, we're going to line it up, get it in queue to, to put it out I, April. That's my plan. And then probably I'm, I'm going to try and follow up and see if I can do a video for the one with me and Rock and Rock because that shit has definitely got to be a single. I just got there's – a, there's a lot of additional schematics I got to work out when you're dealing with, you know, MCs of that caliber. So, but, yeah, I'm fired up, man. It's, it's fire. I'm, it's another – there's a little – uh another level of lyrical fury i will say to this is my follow-up from bars for days it's it's after covid ended it's after losing my moms it's after a lot of changes in my life and it it it, it came out in the music for sure so that's that's the number one uh dime ops we haven't really done much uh recording or or, or playing at all but we have been discussing right now because we just got offered the opportunity to have a free studio it's free studio time, basically. So, actually, when I get off with you, in about 15 minutes, I'm supposed to call my keyboard player, Willem Dellis, for it, and uh, me and him are start plotting on um, the foundation of a, a EP, basically. We're going to do an EP. Word. And I'm excited about that, because it's been a while since we've done anything. And I really want to get us performing again. When I perform, I like to perform with the band. It's dope to be able to DJ. Like, I, you know, I would love to do that sometimes, too, but I really love performing with the band. There's a lot of creative freedom. So I miss that. And and also, like, the band has its own name and legacy and reputation right now. So when we do shows, there's much more potential right now for us to all go out and actually get paid and do our shit. So oh. I've also been balancing that with daddy life. I might say I got two older teenagers, but I got a six-year-old as well. So hasn't been as easy for me to just bounce as other periods in my life. But um, that's gonna all shit changes and and the planes continue to to change and switch around. So I'll be doing more shows, doing things. I'd love to get back to Florida. I love performing in South Florida. I used to have a huge following out there. I still got a lot of people out there that show me a lot of love. California shows me a lot of love. Europe shows me a lot of love. The Northeast, of course, New York, Connecticut, Boston, Philly. You know, I never got to DC and, and Baltimore, but I know where that's coming probably soon. So what what about MHB compilation finally? <laughs> MHB, like I said, Mr. Cord, if you're listening, we are all waiting for that beat uh folder right now. Cause <laughs> we are I said the main the core seven, we are all in, we are ready to rock. Um there is one new track, it's like me, Dick Dashley, and uh Mr. Cord, which is has been recorded, but we haven't done anything. So it's 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 in the it's in the, the folder right now, <laughs> so to speak. Right. I I love MHB, man. It's, it's, it's such an important part of my career, being part of it. I'm such an honor to be with some of these dope MCs and producers. Like I said, I really believe, like, pound for pound, when you put the talent up to some of the greats, I think we are right up there. I, I really believe that. So I really hope we get a chance to prove and put the proof in the pudding type of thing. Uh, so we'll see what happens. But, yeah, that's... That's in the works. It's always in the works. And like I said, me and Lifelong are right in the middle right now working on a track, which is which is dope. So we we working. We all always working with each other. Craft and me and Witchcraft are always working. You know, Craft is doing his thing right now with the certain ones. Shout out to certain ones too. So oh uh, you know, we all busy, man. We all it's like it's like woo or something, man. We all do our own thing and then we get together when we can get together and we make magic. You know what I'm saying? So Word, brother. So, uh, 
I want to thank you for doing this, bro. Taking the yeah, time no. to come on this little show, man. I appreciate you. Um, and I wish you nothing but the best. Uh, so, yeah, just send me any links that you think are important. Like, you can Instagram me the links. And if you could send me, like, a picture so I could put as far, uh, as my thumbnail. And okay. we'll just we'll stay in touch, man. Anytime you drop something, if you want to throw it on any of, like, my Facebook pages or whatever, you want to, like, throw it sure. on, there, on there, bro. I don't have a problem with that, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, so uh, just for the everybody, people that are listening and for you, if you want to see like a like detail about my discography, uh, my my bio, my news, the videos, if you go to my website, which is www.spotmeanickel.com, spotmeanickel.com, it's all on there. You can be able to find everything on there. Um, so hit me up on there. Hit me up on the socials. Mike Nichols everywhere. M I C Nichols N I C K E L S. Right. Some people spell it L E, but it's not L E. That's how you spell pickle. Yeah. <laughs> All right, brother. Thank you, man. All right. Have enjoy your day, brother. Yo, one love, man. Hip hop world. Yeah. We love you, man. Just just keep pushing, man. That's Word it. Up. Just keep making music. Corner. Peace, brother. <laughs>